warming up. There we go. So, um, well, first, web hooks seem like a you know pretty simple, perhaps uh, slightly niche aspect of web development, but um, it's it's basically just another way to send messages backwards and forwards, right? Um, well, that's true, but it can be a lot more than that. It's also a powerful architectural construct that can completely change the way you build uh, your apps. But before we get into that, let's just uh, step back for a second. <coughs> so, um, you know, rather than just being uh, a simple kind of transport mechanism, simple HTTP POST request. Um, <coughs> I had my notes on the front slide instead of on this slide. That's all right. You lost the transition. <laughs> my bad. Um, <coughs> so anyway, thinking about integrations for the moment, um, what are our options for, for integrating with other websites? When you boil it down, there's kind of two main ways you can communicate um, for information, you know, um, that you want to get from another service. You can either pull them until it's ready, um, or you can use webhooks. Um, so polling is uh, basically like, um, for example, calling Sal's Pizza uh, and asking if they can send you a slice of pizza. Uh, they say they don't have any at the moment, but they might have some a bit later on. So you call back and you check every couple of minutes. You figure that must be pretty annoying for them, so maybe you use an exponential back-off strategy. <laughs> um, meanwhile, you're making, um, you're making calls. You hang up the phone after yet another rejection, saying your pizza's not ready yet. And you don't realise this at the time, but um, your pizza's finished a couple of seconds after you hang up the phone. But due to your exponential back-off strategy, you wait another 10 minutes to call again, and now your pizza's cold. So webhooks work more like cells just sending you a fresh slice of pizza every evening when it's ready. You don't have to make a phone call. Uh, they just send it to you. No need to waste your valuable time. So with webhooks, you can sit back, relax, knowing you'll have a steady supply of pizza delivered from the oven. Perfect. That's the benefits of using webhooks right there. <coughs> so what, what are the main strengths, right? They're, they're flexible and efficient. Um, you can use uh, webhooks to deliver updates on basically any kind of message and pretty close to real time. If you want true real time, you might be better to use broadcasting when you're doing kind of first party implementations. Um, but webhooks will get you kind of within a couple of seconds at least of the action. Uh, it's usually a good solution for like, you know, your third party messages if you're sending, integrating with others. Um, and also f it can be for uh, dealing with side effects for your own applications, um, like sending emails or notifications or storing analytics or firing off image encoding jobs, etc. cetera. Um, basically any, uh, any side effect that you can turn into a microservice, you could use webhooks to trigger them. Compared with um, polling, webhooks uh, give you, you know, they're much more resource efficient. Obviously you don't have to respond to incessant check-ins. Um, developers don't have to write all the polling code. Checker doesn't have to schedule the polling. You don't have to pay bandwidth costs for repeated calls, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you can make your applications a lot more fault tolerant. Um, you can quite easily uh, set things up to get a audit trail of um, webhook events that have failed, um, where the s what the status codes were, what the responses were. Uh, you can easily set up um, automated retries or fire off failed jobs uh, again manually after the fact. Um, and we'll go into a bit more detail about how you can achieve that in Laravel in a bit. Um, <coughs> If you're building a webhook server, you also get more flexibility from the architecture. So, um, for example, all of your models in Laravel fire a standard set of events, right? You can use observers to listen to those events. You can fire off um, webhooks for any kind of model creation, updates, deletes, 
um, that sort of stuff. Um, and that means, what that means is um, you can make changes to what your app does without making changes to your primary API's code base. So you can use, you can also use it to turn on or off different side effects in your app just by flicking a status field. So um, we'll get into, again, how you can achieve that. Um, all that sounds really good. I want that. I'd like that too, but it's not happening. <laughs> not in COVID times, but um, <coughs> what, uh, what are our options for making all this a reality in our own uh, projects? As it turns out, actually getting started with both receiving and sending webhooks in Laravel is really easy. Um, there's two really good packages for it, uh, built by Spatty. Um, so they're a fairly prolific development company in Belgium. Chances are you've probably come across their stuff, but if you haven't, go check it out. Um, the first package is a webhook client. Um, so that gets you started with receiving webhooks from third parties. Um, it'll help you verify request signatures, process payloads and queued jobs and all that stuff. Um, makes it pretty easy. Uh, the second one is a webhook server and that allows you to send um, outgoing webhooks. It assists you with um, strategies for signing calls, uh, retries if you've got errors going on, among other things. Um, <coughs> so today we're mostly going to focus on the server implementation. Um, you'll find the client stuff is really easy to set up and it's pretty simple. Um, but this is the one which gives you the most benefit for your own kind of system architectures. So let's um, say for example uh, we've got an internal app. Um, whenever a new team user signs up we need to send them a message in Slack, right? A welcome message, say hi, welcome to the team. Um, with webhooks you could approach this by setting up a microservice for sending those, uh, sending that Slack notification. When a new um, team member is created in your app, your API fires off the webhook, um, that invokes a serverless function, which then sends the welcome message uh, to your new user. Um, at first glance, this seems a bit more complicated than how you'd traditionally approach this with a Laravel app. Um, but if you dive a little deeper into the architecture, there's a few benefits to the way we're doing, uh, the way we could do things here. Um, firstly, your application doesn't need to know anything about the Slack integration. There's no additional dependencies for this function in your code base. Um, so when it comes time to update to Laravel 9, um, there's fewer things to worry about, fewer external dependencies to wait on for third parties to update. And if you spread that over like potentially dozens of integrations or side effects in your apps, you've probably saved yourself a dozen new dependencies or libraries. Um, <coughs> the serverless function is a s small standalone piece of code. So it's quite easy to understand and it does one thing and that makes it much more easily testable um, and more easily updatable. So all that piece of code does in this case is it takes your webhook request from your API, uh, reformats it for Slack and fires it through. It's a very small little shim. Um, <coughs> because it's a cloud serverless function, it scales automatically. So particularly if you're using something like AWS Lambda or Firebase Cloud Functions or um, Google Cloud. Um, well, you know, Firebase, Google, whatever. It's the same thing under the hood. Um, <coughs> And the third point is, you know, if you need to make changes to that Slack integration, let's say Slack's updated their API and given you no warning and it's Friday, um, you can simply just disable the microservice um, while you resolve the issue. And in the meantime, you won't have lost any of your webhook calls because they've been queuing up um, and you've got them in the system as failed webhook, um, as failed calls. So they can either automatically, periodically retry in the background, or um, you can fire them off again once you've resolved and deployed the, the new update and re-enabled the service. So as you can see from this picture, uh, 
the architecture gives your APIs a you know, huge flexibility and agility. Um, you can launch entire new pieces of functionality by writing a new microservice and registering a webhook in your app. So maybe you need a new email notification or you need to store some data for analytics or whatever it is. Just register a new webhook, write that small function, and away you go. No um, major code changes to your API, no deployments, no new dependencies to worry about. <coughs> Um, firing off webhooks, it's really easy. After you install the webhook server, um, you just create a new webhook call. You define the URL, and the payload, and a secret for signing the request, and wait, send it off. So by default, um, these will automatically run in your default queue, but you can customize that in your config, along with you know your request signing method, uh, timeouts, retry limits, back off strategies, all that stuff. Um, is fully customizable. All this becomes a lot more powerful when you have a built-in webhook registry capable of three things, three critical things. So one is a link to Laravel events so that you can easily fire webhooks from any system event that you fire in Laravel. Um, number two is a registry of webhook endpoints to call when specific events are fired. Um, and number three is traceability logging of webhook requests and responses. Um, so, you know, that allows you to subscribe specific webhook calls to any combination of events. And we've put together a package that wraps the Spatty webhook server uh, and implements the registry functions for your app. So let's um, have a wee look at how that works. <coughs> the same slide from last time. Uh, right, we'll get out of here. <coughs> so we've got this go mirroring. Okay. So I've got a little um, Laravel app, which I've set up here, and uh, this is basically just a, a fresh checkout. Um, there's, there's nothing special in there. Um, you'll see the Doxel stuff, which I've talked about before, but um, that's basically just a way of running um, things in a container locally. Um, <coughs> you can do that however you normally do your development. Um, but when you see me using the fin command, you know that's just kind of shorthand for, you know, executing something within the container of the, or the context that it's running in. So you just use whatever no your normal commands are. Um, so first thing we're going to do <coughs> is um, install the library from um, with Composer. I'm probably, yeah, I am connected to the Wi Fi. So, hopefully, thanks to Composer 2, we won't be waiting here forever. And once that's installed, um, we'll then publish the, the config files. Um, from this. You can also publish the migrations. Um, the package allows you to um, completely switch out the models that you're using and all that. Um, but for now we'll just do the config files. Almost there. Cool. So now we've got a config file, hopefully, um, which um, defines the models that we're going to use for different things. So you can see here we've got three different models. We've got one for tracking your webhook endpoints, one for binding events to an endpoint, uh, and one for logging your requests. Um, 
The reason we have uh, endpoint and event as two separate things that are split out is, you know, that's part of the power of, of webhooks, right? You can have one URL that accepts your uh, requests that handles multiple different events and then kind of splits them up and processes them however you like. Or for example, you might have several events that are quite similar in nature, like um, for our user example, um, when you create or update a user, you might have an action that you want to, um, that you might want to execute on, you know, when either of those events happen. Uh, and it could be the same action dealing with the same piece of data. So for example, if you're trying to say uh, store analytics and work out um, what the most common first name is in your um, in your office, then uh, you know you could write a webhook that accepts both the create and the update or saving event. Um, so we will next run our migrations. So obviously the package um, exposes a set of migrations. We'll open up um, the database and we can see those three tables in there now. <coughs> um, <coughs> here's one I prepared earlier. Whoops, I didn't, I'll, I'll, I'll migrate fresh. Here we go. <coughs> there we go. That's more like it. So we've got our um, endpoints, events, and requests table. They're all pretty simple, straightforward tables. Um, <coughs> then um, for the purposes of this demo, we're going to use this handy little uh, webhook debugging site. So if you go to webhook.site, it, um, it will generate a random um, UUID uh, for you, and you can use this unique URL um, to test and debugs, right? So you can see any requests that come through into here, it's quite handy. Um, <coughs> it also will persist stuff for you, and it's completely free to use the basic functionality. Um, so let's uh, go in and register the webhook for the site. quite a simple call. You just use the facade, uh, webhook registry, register endpoint. You can give it uh, whatever name you like um, and obviously the webhook URL itself. <coughs> there we go. Check the database. We should see it in there. That's good. Um, next, um, we will create a new model, right? So we're going to we're going to just fire off a model event um, and see how that comes through. So we'll make our model, whoops, better exit tinker there. <coughs> so that's created our model and our pizzas table migration. Um, we'll go into our new model, make a new field. Fillable. So we've got a name field that's fillable, and we'll go to our migration and um, add that name field in. Migrate up. Cool. So now we should have our pizzas table with a name. It's good. Um, then we'll make a pizza. Who knew this was going to turn into a baking course, right? cooking or whatever. Uh, right, so grab that, make a meat lover's pizza. <coughs> so um, obviously um, if we go back over here, you'll see that no webhooks have been sent yet. And that's because we haven't bound our event. Um, so we haven't even made an event yet. Um, so what we'll do um, is we will make our made pizza event. So this is, oh, keep doing that. Um, 
So this is, you know, obviously one way you could hook into the, the native model events under the hood, or you can hook into any kind of custom event. Um, we're going to do a kind of hybrid approach where we'll use the model to drive the event, uh, and then um, hook into a custom event that we've pushed from the model. Makes sense? <laughs> um, so we should have a uh, made, oops, made pizza event. Now, Laravel is going to give us a whole bunch of broadcasting stuff um, by default, which I'll just replace. <coughs> so you can see um, <laughs> what, I'm <laughs> what I'm doing here is I've created a uh, context property on this, um, on this event, and when the event gets fired, it will accept a pizza model, and we're going to store only the name and the created at uh, timestamp for that pizza. That's all we want to expose in this event. Um, you could put whatever you want there. You could put the whole model. doesn't matter. It's up to you. Uh, if you put the whole model, the, the webhooks library will run two array on it. So <coughs> much the same as you would with a API or whatever. Um <coughs> okay, so next up we're going to um, add the uh, the contracts and the traits that this will tell our webhook library to listen to this event um, and how to how to deal with it. So you get this contract um, should deliver webhooks, right? So anything that implements that contract, we will try to deliver as a webhook. Um, we also give you this trait, which um, gives you all of the kind of base um, kind of set up. Uh, you can fully customize this. So if we have a quick look at the um, GitHub webhook registry, <coughs> add the docs in here. Um, these methods in here. Um, you can see, you know, the, the, the contract expects these methods and you can override any of them um, to, to completely change the behavior if you need to. Um, but we give you kind of, you know, sensible defaults out of the box. Um, so one of those sensible defaults is to read the context property and send that as part of your payload. Um, and to um, read the event name and send that as a part of the event payload. You can override all that. <coughs> so <coughs> let's um, just make sure our model knows how to fire this event. Again, you can use whatever mechanism to fire the event that you like. This is just what I'm doing for demo purposes. <coughs> um, so we're going to use our made pizza event, and we're going to dispatch it when the pizza is created. Cool? Easy as. <coughs> right. Next up we need to register the event to our webhook endpoint. Um, so right now we've got a webhook endpoint that isn't listening to any events. So we want to specifically say, okay, we're listening to this event um, for this endpoint. Uh, again, you know, you could register however many different endpoints you want and listen to whatever events you want against each endpoint. Um, <coughs> So that was Tinker. <coughs> now, first argument here is the ID, and I know it's one, so <laughs> you'd probably use a more sensible way of determining that in your code. But <coughs> um, and of course, the second is the name or namespace of the event that you're um, of the event class that you're listening to. Uh, so now let's make a pizza. Make another one, pepperoni this time. So if we jump over here, we should see that come through. So uh, we've fired off a uh, webhook. It's come and it's been received by the service, and this is the content. Um, that the library just put together for us. Uh, as you can see, it's got the event name, which is just the class name by default. Again, you can override that. Um, 
you just set the um, webhook event name property uh, and it will, you know, you can use dot notation or whatever kind of public notation you like um, to, to set up your events. Um, <coughs> we've got um, the context, so that was the that context property that we stored with only the name and the created at. And we've got a triggered by, and because I'm not authenticated, that's just put nobody system. But if you were authenticated, that would be your user ID, right? Um, of the person who fired that action. Again, everything in there, fully customizable. If you want to over override the, the context, which, very, which property that comes from or how you build that, you can overload the get webhook context function in your event. Uh, if you want to overload the whole payload, you can do that also. And that will be uh, whatever gets passed to the Spatey um, webhooks uh, server plugin. Um, so you can have a look at that, um, at that plugin to see you know, what the options are there, um, particularly around tags, uh, tags for tracking with Horizon and that sort of thing. Um, <coughs> So um, the next thing that we can see uh, if we have a look in the, in the database, let's see our two pizzas, you can also see in here that um, we've recorded the payload um, that we sent um, and the response body, right? So I um, can't really see that unless I do this. Select the row. So you can see the message has responded with thanks uh, IP address and uh, that's because the webhook site lets you um, put in whatever response body or response type you like. So you can debug your kind of error scenarios, that sort of thing. Um, <coughs> so you get that you know, nice audit trail. Uh, and again, because we're recording that payload, it makes it really easy to fire off that, uh, that webhook again if you need to for, for debugging purposes or for you know, error recovery purposes. Make sense? So that's pretty much it. It's pretty, pretty simple. Um, and you know, now we've got a, a huge amount of power with how we approach, um, approach our webhooks. Know, you might be able to um, set up a, a AWS Lambda, you know, set of cloud functions, set up an API gateway to route your requests into there, and um, then you know, using this registry, all you have to do is, is register new webhooks when you're adding new functionality to your app. So you can kind of see how powerful that can be. So if you've got a big, you know, big API that has you know lots uptime requirement or whatever, um, you, you can ship new functionality without even touching your API. Pretty cool. Any questions? Yep, so that's built into the um, Laravel webhook server package. Um, <coughs> so you can see in this config file here, um, they've got a backoff strategy so that just by default uses exponential backoff. Uh, it will try for three times, but you know, you publish that config file and you can change that to whatever you like. Sure, yeah, um, and it will uh, each um, each log in here you'll see has a UUID, um, so you can use that to trace through your requests. So you know if if you're um, if you're worried about tracing the whole kind of you know request lifecycle and everything that happens from that request, you could use a middleware to generate that UUID, inject it, um, and then you've got you know full logging, full traceability for that whole request and whatever webhooks that fired off. Um, if this uh, was an error, um, 
you would have multiple entries, multiple failed entries in here for for that webhook, um, and it would tell you, you know, what attempt number it is, that sort of stuff, um, what the error was for each one. So, you know, if you've got third parties who are, who you're allowing to register webhooks against your API, um, you can show them that information and show them what they're doing wrong. <coughs> Um, I don't think there really is, like I think it's actually reasonably comparable, um, if anything um, polling is probably slightly more work for you to set up on your end, it's probably a bit easier for them to set up, um, but you know that's likely because they don't have a, a modern infrastructure, you know a modern event based um, you know pattern in their, in their code, um, so yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, again in the Spatey package, you can they, they fire off events, um, where is it, um, yeah these, uh, these events here, so they've got specific events that you can listen to, webhook call succeeded, webhook call failed, uh, final webhook call failed. Um, so you can hook into those to do whatever you like. Mm -hmm. um, oh, one of our dev days. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yep. <coughs> um, so the the question was, when did I create that package? Well, actually, Craig did the first version of it. Um, and then I took it over, um, <laughs> stole his thunder. No, um, <coughs> I did the first version of it in one of our dev days actually um, last year, end of last year. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We've got uh, one of our systems is using this in production now. Yeah. Mm. Um, soon to be more. Mm. Yep, so that's something that I want to add to the library as a job that you can schedule easily. Um, I haven't done anything like that yet, but it is a relatively simple job that you can write if you need it. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. Cool, yep. So there you go, there's a good solution. 